Welcome, everyone, to Tim's Vinyl Confessions. I am Tim Durling, and on this episode, I am joined by the man behind Rock Daydream Nation, Mr. Peter Kerr. Hello, Peter. Pleased to be on the show. Good to be on. Now, Peter, Peter and I have done a lot of episodes about, uh, you know, we've talked about White Snake, we've talked about Blue Murder, and uh, I know that Peter's a huge Deep Purple fan, so I thought no, no better... No better person to uh, talk about this episode, which is us going through our deep purple vinyl. So, I mean, purple, are they they right up there for you, right? Oh, absolutely. I'm a deep purple tragic. They were the um, gateway to hard rock and heavy metal for me. Um, I got the very best of deep purple, I think, in 82, 83, and my journey into hard rock started. That's a good, that's a really good comp. So we're going to go through, um, yeah, we're going to go through our, uh, you know, Mark 1, 2, 3, 4. I don't think that neither of us have any of the Steve Morris era on vinyl. I wish I had a couple of their more recent ones, but we've got some cool yeah. things. And I don't know what Peter's got. He doesn't know what I've got. So I'm looking forward to see uh, the difference in labels, uh, the difference in certain compilations and live albums that maybe I don't have. Um, yep. So, yeah, we'll get started. Uh, and I guess the, the best way to get started is with the first album, all the way back to 1968, Shades of Deep Purple. And uh, the version I've got, I see already, yeah, I've seen several cover variants for this. And uh, he's got the one, I think, that looks the best, which is just that single band photo. I've got this one that's got the repeated images on it. Looks totally different on the back. Uh, the version that I have... I think is from it's from it's Canadian and it's very, very scratched. Uh, and it is on Polydor. All right. Okay. Yeah. yeah I'm like a I... lot of the Japanese pressings of deep purple were on the old Polydor label. That looks quite recent and shiny. It's very yeah. scratched. When I hold it up yeah. to this light, it is extremely scratched. Yeah. So yours is a, this is a 1968 Parlophone. What ah, a great label. The label of the Beatles. That's and, right. Um, the black label. And um, it plays really well. It's an original pressing. So I like this album a lot. I, I, I don't think Mark One get the kudos they deserve. And um, their version of Hush is just absolutely killer. It's a it classic. Was in the Quint it was in the Quentin Tarantino movie Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. People are starting to, oh, wow, that, that's that's actually a great song. And the most valuable player in this album is actually John Lord. Richie Blackmore starting to get his style, but John Lord is holding it together, and it's some of the heaviest keyboard work you'll hear in any rock. He he is just the, the guy that holds this band together. But I think it's a pretty damn fine album. I've um, I've always thought that John Lord, is what made Deep Purple heavy, more so than Blackmore. I mean, Blackmore was great, obviously, but the way that his guitar was recorded, it wasn't the the low end, you know. Yep. But like, but John Lord's Hammond B three was just it just gave the, the music so much so much weight. Because um, he's playing he's playing like a de facto rhythm guitar, yeah, the bottom yeah. bottom end. But um, yeah, I I think it's a really I think it's the best out of the mark. Um, one that's that's my pick the first album yeah. Shades it's pretty purple. it's pretty hard not to like hush i mean that's just such a classic song yeah um yep so later i think later that same year 1968 the second album comes out the book of Taliesin, and um the version i have i think is a i think it's it, it's either u.s printed in canada or it's from canada it's on tetragrammaton records and very interesting cover now, yours is a gatefold. Mine is not just a single sleeve. I don't know if anything else came with it, but this is what the record itself looks like. Yeah. And the back Mine's of the sleeve... Mine's not a, an original pressing. Mine is like a modern... Um, this is a, a modern pressing on white vinyl. It's interesting so... with the Deep Purple albums, too, because those first three have been issued so many times. Sometimes the uh, the pressings are kind of cheap and... and uh, you know, mm -hmm. low budget looking, but you've got a nice EMI harvest issue there. Mine's kind of leans to more towards the cheap side. <laughs> uh, yeah. Now, the next one that I have is interesting for a few reasons. I'm just double checking to make sure I've got that right. Uh, 
the third Deep Purple album, which came out in 1969, was self-titled. And yeah, mine is definitely a reissue. Um, got this uh, interesting cover, this hero, uh, I can't remember his name, Bosch is his last name. Wow, that's totally different. Yeah, wow. that's the uh, Australian only version, I believe, where it was just in purple. So you've got the you've got the fancy medieval type uh, artwork, and I've just yeah. got just purple. So mine's mine's got this weird gatefold that's up and down, not side to mm. side, and it's actually on the bottom. So if I want to see the rest of it, I have to flip up the top. Yep. and get it all. I've also seen CD versions that zoom right in on one of the images. Like I said, been issued several times, and very very interesting. Uh, you know, artwork. And, and I think, yeah, the inside is kind of the same, uh, you know, song yeah. by song, talking about each song, although mine's a, uh, a different uh, different shade of purple, as it were. Yeah, really interesting. And and, and they, do a little, they do a little spiel on each song. Remember, like, some of the albums in the late 60s where you'd have somebody do the, uh, the liner notes and, and talk about the song? Yeah. That's yeah. that's interesting. That's something that kind of went went out of fashion. Now I know yeah. mine's a real issue because uh, it's a Canadian issue on Warner Brothers. So for a time, uh, Warner Brothers had you know rights to at least this one. I've got a cassette, a Canadian cassette of this on Warner as well. I I don't know that I've ever seen the first two, although I I don't know why there wouldn't be. But like I said, the the rights to those first three Deep Purple albums are kind. They've always been kind of um, fluid. Like no one company mm. is. Uh, you know, own the rights to them, which is why you do see a lot of cheap uh, looking reissues of them, particularly the cassettes. The cassettes can look really, really low budget and truck stop uh, tape yep. sort of thing. Uh, next thing I have is actually the only uh, this out. It's the only thing I have this album on as of right now is the concerto for group and orchestra uh, conducted by Malcolm Arnold. So I'll be honest, I've never actually played this record. I've heard I mixed gonna, I was going to ask you that. I've heard <laughs> mixed reviews about this. Yeah. Uh, this is a nice, it's a nice gatefold. It's a gatefold where one of the um, parts of this is just a single cardboard layer. This uh, second part, okay, the, the record slides out of this middle section. I'm not the biggest fan when they do that. And this is a Canadian version on um, Warner Brothers. Yeah. What are your thoughts on, on, on this album? Um, look, I'm not a big fan of orchestra and um, rock. Um, yeah, I'm I don't not a big groover on that genre of music, but um, it's not too bad. I think it actually comes alive when the orchestra silent and Deep Purple improvise and rock out. Um, yeah, there's a few bits and pieces where the orchestra are going with the band and it sort of clashes. But no, I've never been a big fan of that. I've tried it with Metallica. Um, Scorpions have tried it. I've got a couple in, in my collection. But to be quite frank, they just collect us. What, what do you think of that genre of music, Tim? Are you oh, boy, I'm not I'm not the biggest fan of it. Um, I mean, I, I was pretty scathing in my review of the Def Leppard Drastic Symphonies, mostly because it's. It's the original recordings with orchestra dubbed over it. I think that was a completely pointless exercise. As far wow. as, yeah, it's terrible, except for a couple, which I, I just don't like it. I just don't like it. Um, now, as yeah. far as Metallica goes, wasn't the biggest fan of the first one, but I actually &M. did. I did enjoy SM2. I thought that was quite a bit better. I liked the song selection, and it seemed, mm. and maybe it's because it was the second time around, it seemed to integrate the orchestra better. I'm not the biggest fan of the Kiss one. Um, you know, to me, it's, it's, uh, you know, a way to get product out without writing any new songs. And it's mm. not the best way, I don't think. I mean, you know, there are elements, you know, hard rock and heavy metal where classical, in, you know, obviously was an influence, but it's often, you know, it, it becomes very spinal tap. Uh, not that that was in spinal tap, but it just seems like a kind of a, a well, okay, Here's here's the obligatory uh, orchestral album, and the Deep Purple at least were one of the first, and yes. it uh, it was all it, it wasn't older songs being reinterpreted at this point. It was all new material, so it, that's it was a full on concerto. Yeah, and I mean John Lord wrote it. 
Mm. Yeah, and they revisited that what now ninety six to get sometime in the nineties or two thousand. Yeah, so, yeah, late nineties. Uh, yeah, I'll give them credit; they they believed in it. But things yeah. are about to get way better. Uh, with uh, yes. so now now that now that uh, we've got Mark II fully, you know, Mark II exists now. But now they really get in gear within Rock nineteen seventy, which this is just so ahead of its time. Um, yeah, I mean, this is just a, it's funny, I, it, you know, it, it the, the, the album art, it, it's what it is. This is a landmark album. Uh, it's an iconic a, album yeah. cover. Mine's a, mine's a Wonder Brothers issue here. Um, yeah. Now, they could have done something different with the back. All they've got is the song titles written. But um, again, this is another one of those gatefolds that opens a little bit differently, but that's what's on the inside of of yep. mine and it also it's got the lyrics but it's also got very very brief notes on each track which i i find those are kind of amusing and mm. um it's another canadian issue with the warner brothers uh burbank palm trees label which i've always liked um yeah a great 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 album like uh it, you know, if, if somebody were to listen to this for the first time, didn't like it, say, well, I, I don't think you should bother going any further because this is Deep Purple. Like, this is the essence of what people love about Deep Purple. And wildly influential. I mean, if that wasn't for Ian Rock, you wouldn't have so many bands. I think um, I always recite Bruce Dickinson said, when I heard Ian Rock, I knew I wanted to be a rock singer. So it's inspired yeah. so many artists. Deep Purple, too. I mean, Deep, you know, of the... The three bands that sort of get mentioned the most for the origination of this music, you know, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple. Um, Deep Purple kind of get the short end, you know, they're usually the third mentioned, but I, I will say this about Purple. I think any any hard rock band that ever had a keyboard player and they owe Deep Purple because Deep Purple legitimized having a keyboard player in a rock band. And like I said, he made things sound so heavy um yes yes so yeah a classic and and you know at this point they're just churning the records out next up 1971 yeah fireball i'm just you gonna know, i'm just gonna chime in just before that oh, i've got a, oh, yeah. a live album called stockholm 1970 so you might see a few little live ones from me and yep. um and that's the the track listings so it's basically you've got basically. a lot of mark one songs and they're showcasing um in rock as well so it's a pretty yeah. mighty fine live album and, and there live is where they're at that, yeah there's a lot in that series that that have a similar look to them which is kind of neat yeah yeah sorry but i just wanted to no that's interject. great no this, yeah, see, i yeah. knew we'd have some some differing uh yeah. and uh that's probably going to be the first of many so yeah fireball 1971 not the greatest album cover but you you know the album so it's classic in that way and 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 the 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 way that Fireball is written is so early seventies. I like it. Um, yeah. And it continues on the back cover, so it's meant to be you know the full image, right? Which is something that you miss with uh, really most other media. Uh, not a lot for credits inside of this, but you got mm -hmm. photos of the band. Um, yeah, this is it. Kind of falls in between the cracks. Uh, because of the album that came out before and the album that came out after. Now, this is a this is um, a Canadian issue, but it's this one's a little bit older. So the other ones have had that Burbank logo on them. This one has the olive green Warner Brothers logo. I've got some Alice nice. Cooper records that look like this too. So yes. this is a fairly this is a pretty old one. Um, yeah, because you know, the Burbank yeah. ones would have been reissues. So and they're nice solid vinyl folks it's not like that flimsy reissues in the 80s where you could wobble it i can imagine it's just feels nice and solid it, yeah it yeah, does and the, the other thing is that what i don't you know a lot of times issue reissues in the 80s they did away with the gate folds so yeah that was kind yes. of you know, it's way to sell them cheaper use less material so yeah so it's, uh, it's not a bad album man um it it gets ignored, but it's quite experimental. You see Blackmore's using harmonics. He's yeah. more textural in a lot of his runs. This is a band that's not afraid to push the boundaries and not just do In Rock Part 2. So I think it doesn't get the kudos. But the um, a lot of people say, why was a strange kind of woman on it? 
because um, they did a lot of singles um, during the 70s that did yeah. make the album. And that's a, last um, a lot of people vestige. say, why didn't yeah. that make it? So that's a, that's sort of a last vestige of um, of the 60s. Right. That, that, that kind of went out of fashion that, uh, you know, until much, much later, like more recently. You know, actually, you know what? My my uh, my copy has Strange Kind of Woman on his track three on side one. Wow. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> uh, so there's the but, track listing there. So you got seven. So it, yours is got oh, eight. you've got you've got Demon's Eye. That's right. Yes. Yeah. See, we didn't so, get Demon's Eye in in North America until um, until the Deepest Purple came out in 1980. Yeah, so, I think those two songs are quite similar. So that's right. maybe why it was a yeah, like. They're both, they're, like. Both the, they're both the shuffle, and yeah. yeah, I like both songs. But wow, I'm glad I that up i never yeah. knew that yeah. well at the okay. same time i have to remind myself that black knight isn't on in rock yes which is odd you know it's a standalone single um I, one of their songs that i don't have on anything right now is their song hallelujah like where yes. did that come where did that come from <laughs> absolutely absolutely was black knight a hit in canada that was actually released in, in a, as a single in the uk and hit number two I'm they actually sure. had some singles that charted quite well. I'm not sure how their singles did in Canada, to be honest with mm. you. I know that in the U.S. they only had um, Hush, Hush went to number and, Hush and Smoke on the Water both went to number four, and Kentucky yep. Woman went to 38. Um, but that yep. was it as far as top 40. They had other songs like um, Might Just Take Your Life and, and Knocking at Your Back Door that went it, were in the, the top 100, but. Uh, yeah. That's the only one. And and Canada, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if they had a few more in Canada because yeah. English acts sometimes did better in Canada than they did in the States. I don't know if that was because we were part of the Commonwealth or what that is, but that it wouldn't yeah. surprise me. I didn't do that's homework. I didn't do. I'll have to, I'll have to yeah. look that up sometime. Of yeah. course, next, next thing I've got is, is the biggest Deep Purple album. Uh, and, and mine could really stand to be replaced because it's in rough shape. Yep. Uh, 1972 Machine Head. This one has, it's been all taped up along the side. <laughs> uh, you can't read the spine anymore. I will replace this eventually. This was, uh, this was just a placeholder. Um, I've always liked all the pictures, the way they did all the pictures inside here. They even have a picture of uh, uh, Funky Claude, who uh, passed away not too, too long ago. Claude Knobs. Yeah, He's, Claude you know, Knobs, name, yeah. name checked in... Uh, smoke on the water i don't know if there's anything else that originally came with it but uh and this again this, a, is, this came oh yeah you know that's yeah. in the that's in the cd yeah that's right yeah yeah um so this is a canadian warner brothers obviously it's a later slightly later issue and a uh, lyric sheet too okay so yeah i really need to replace mine <laughs> there you go long lyric yeah. sheet of all the all the things and this was, um, remember, Tim, they used to um, put out quadraphonic albums in the yes. early 70s. This was a quadraphonic album. And incidentally, folks, um, Rhino Records have re-released a whole series of 70s albums. I think um, Alice Cooper. Yeah, just uh, Black Killer Sabbath. Schools Out, I think, just came out yeah. not too long ago. Quadraphonic yeah. albums are being reissued. So that's yeah. more money coming out of my hip pocket. You know, for a brief period too, and if our buddy Ernesto was here, he would probably he has probably some of them. They even put up quadraphonic eight tracks for a time. Because I I've wow. seen uh, I've seen the Muscle of Love album on a quadraphonic. They only have two tracks on them, which is kind of strange. So I guess they weren't eight tracks. I guess they were four tracks. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. um, I've got something else from 1972 here as well. Um, of course, the Mark One. Not only were those albums issued and reissued and reissued, but compilations of them. There were so many. But one of the, uh, I guess this is an official one because it's on Warner Brothers, it's, it's Purple Passages. Um, ah. I've seen different color variants of it. I don't know if you can tell. It's deep purple written there, but it's kind of, yeah. you know. And then it's got Purple Passages in brackets for some reason. Um, right. And uh, this is just, you know, a, a mix of songs from the first three albums. Um, a lot of ring wear on here. Yeah, this I is think I've seen that. Um, sure I've, got, seen that. I've got this on 8-track as well. Um, yeah. So I'm not sure. This might not have come out in all the territories, but um, it's got, you know, basically a write-up of this yeah. era. And I've got now inside of this, I've got something similar to what you just showed. 
And this must have been something Warner Brothers was doing at the time, because yeah. this is uh, Saturday, September 23rd, 1917, Burbank, California. So that's that row of palm trees that you see on the label. But that's just an mm. old, old photo. And this has the Warner Reprise Loss Leaders. These must have been albums that were discounted, like that were like budget line series. And they're advertising them on the sleeve. I'll just get one of the records out. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same Burbank label. And the other sleeve is um, the other sleeve is exactly like that. So, yeah. Um, Ah, I've got something else. Now, I'm not sure of the year on this, um, Peter, but this just to illustrate my point, how many times this happened. Have you ever seen this before? No. Best, it's just called Best of Deep Purple. Um, and this is a Canadian issue on Polydor again with a, like a silhouette of the band. It's, it's funny, I, it's Rod Evans. It's got like kind of like a, like a Count Dracula <laughs> going on with his collar like that. But, uh, and again, this is just an eight song um, compilation. When did, when did that come out? When did I'm that not come sure. Out? There's no year on it. That's what yeah. I, that's, I kind of just put it after that purple passages. And that's, there's wow. the, the red Polydor label. Now, funny story about this. Um, my friend, John, good buddy of mine, we were, um, you know, same age and we were just basically listening to the same music. Now, his parents had a record collection at his place, and I remember they had this record. Now, I didn't know much about Deep Purple. We're talking late 80s at this point. I didn't know much about Deep Purple. I knew that David Coverdale, and I was a huge White Snake fan even back then, was once mm -hmm. in Deep Purple. I didn't know. I really didn't know anything about them. I knew Smoke on the Water, and I knew from seeing the videos, like from like Perfect Strangers, House of Blue Light, that sort of stuff. And... Uh, I said, you know, a lot of people talk about how great this band is, and, you know, influential, and like Metallica talked about Deep Purple all the time. So we put this album on, and the first track on here is their version of River Deep Mountain High. And we didn't get very far in, which is mm. why I say to someone, if they're interested in getting in Deep Purple, it's like, let someone guide you. <laughs> you know, yeah. here's where you should start. You know, don't get to some of this stuff until later. So that was the wrong thing for us to to be listening to at the time. We eventually got into them later after hearing some other songs, but this this isn't exactly the introduction that you want to give a teenager in the late 80s to Deep Purple. Well, that, um, that's, but, that's a mind blow. I have never seen that, a version of that album ever. It's, it's I've, weird. I've seen a lot of Deep Purple comps, but I've never seen that. I've got that one on eight track as well. I've seen it on cassette. Yeah. I don't know if there's a CD version of it. Yeah. Uh, ditto for Purple Passages. I've, I've never seen a CD version of yeah. that either. Yeah. So, okay. um, so next up, uh, the next thing I've got is from, I believe, 1973. Yeah. Ooh. Classic yeah. live album. Uh, yes. Now, yours is different already because yours says Deep Purple Live and mine does not. Made in Japan. Yeah. So mine's got a fair bit of ring wear. I don't mind a little ring wear. Yeah. I think there's something yeah. classic about that. but uh, And the story goes that Phil Collin from um, Def Leppard was in this photo somewhere. He's in the third row. Yes. Well, that's what I've he tells that. everybody. He yep. tells everybody. So that's cool. Yeah. Um, and I like the ins I like the inner sleeve of this, too. I've always liked this, uh, the Japanese motif here. Yeah. Uh, it says where all of these songs were recorded, of course. Yeah. Each one. It's Osaka. a great live album, but I could I could lose the uh, the drum solo that takes up most of one side. It it goes on and on and on. It's I you know I'm I'm kind of you know I'm kind of like our friend Martin Popoff. I would rather just listen to the studio tracks when when the bands tend to stretch these out. It's one thing if you were at the concert, and I've never I've never seen Deep Purple. I've never had the pleasure, but after a while, I would think, boy, you could get three more songs in there at the time it takes you to, you know. Yeah. do all that stuff but this is another yeah. canadian edition uh it's just got plain white sleeves on here so I there's nothing fancy there there's the uh the burbank label and again like you said so side two uh side two of just consists of smoke on the water and the mule so two songs taking up an entire side now i don't think this is quite as bad as uh the song remains the same for like taking songs and stretching them out although 
That it might be. I don't know. It just seems like they've they there's not a lot of tracks on here. Like if you get the CD and you go, well, why is this such a long album? It's only got, you know, it, mm. it, it, it's literally only got seven songs on it, but it's what they do with those songs. Rainbow on stage is like that too. It's yeah, it's yeah. a long album with not that many tracks on it. Yeah, but um, this uh, was actually for a period of time winning a lot of polls as one of the greatest live albums oh, yeah. of all time, up there with the the Who and whatever. But yeah. I, I like it. I like it a lot. But the drum solo, I, I skip it. I just yeah, that's no I disrespect can't handle to, that. The, to the great Ian Pace. Certainly, it's just, yeah. Um, yep. The next thing I've got is the final, well, the initial final studio album from, from the Mark II lineup. And right now, it's the only thing I've got this on is who do we think we are? Now, my copy is, this is an import, uh, and I can't remember exactly where it's from. I'll find out. Now, this is um, this is also 1973. Um, let me see here. Yeah, same, same gatefold. It's very possible we might have the same version. Um, yeah, my the purple, purple records. Purple records, it's EMI. This is a British version. This is a UK version. Yeah. Uh, now, what does the record itself look like? Okay, so now this is neat. Now, this is actually... Also, I want to say this is a very glossy, shiny... It's almost like it's got a plastic sheen over it, this cover. Yeah, well, that looks like a first edition. Mine's a little bit duller. So oh. usually when you've got the sheen, that means that's a first edition. So that's what mine looks like on the label. Yeah, the I reckon you've got an early edition. You've got a, and also look at the matrix. The matrix A and B usually says whether it's a um, a first pressing. But uh, this is an underrated album. This uh, doesn't get a lot of love. Um, the big song was Woman from Tokyo, which sort of yep. had a shadow over the rest of the, the songs. This oh, is a wow. lyric You've sheet got... that came lyric with it. It's, not a, yeah, it's, yes. not, it's just a single-sided sheet, which is rare. I usually don't yeah. luck out and find these ones with all the stuff in it. But Yeah. yeah. But um, Richie and Ian weren't getting along on this album. And no. it was kind of, this was the end of Mark II. They were, um, there was a lot of acrimony um, between them and the making of this album. I, I heard stories they just didn't speak to each other for like six months which uh, wouldn't be good for band dynamics. No, especially a guitarist and a singer who are supposed mm. to be. Yeah. Um, but um, underrated. Yeah, and, and not really that easy. Like all of those other Mark II albums I've found on CD without ordering them. I don't, I've never seen Who Do We Think We Are on CD just in a store. Like it, it, it's, it, it's kind of, it's surprising because it's still from the Mark. It's a little bit like Alice Cooper, Muscle of Love. It's the last one. And it yep. was a, a little bit later to get reissued. So, of course, yeah. now the you know, changes happen, uh, big changes. Uh, Ian Gillen, Roger I've Glover. Got out, I've got a But you've got something. Gap. Oh, I've, power, yes, I've seen this. I don't have it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hope I've got the right year. Maybe this came out a little bit later, but I'm, I'm putting it in because well, the material got a couple of is. So it looks got like it's painted 19... horse. Yeah, and "Cry Free," which were a couple of um, songs that they recorded in Mark II, but never made to an album. So that's why I'm slotting it in. But um, I think by it, it came out in '77, but I, I guess I'm slotting it in because it, it comes from that that era, the Mark. II yeah, era. time period. The music, the music on it. Yeah, you've got the right time period for sure. That's yeah. I don't have that. I, I've seen it. Yeah. To be quite frank, I should play it a lot more. I don't play it that often, but it's, yeah, just one of those little odd compilations that came out in the day. Powerhouse. Yeah. They had a lot. I mean, Deep Purple had, by the end of the 70s, they had already a lot of compilations and live albums. Yes, 100%. Radio. Yeah. The okay, the next so next, of course, the beginning of Mark Three. I think you're really excited to talk about Mark Three. <laughs> Oh, it's my favorite Deep Purple album. I, I'm Rock Day Dream Nation. I controversially said, is this the greatest Deep Purple album? And all of the naysayers, no, it's not, um, blah, blah, blah. But I love it. I think it's my favorite Deep Purple album. We agree um, that it's a great album for sure. Now, where we where we disagree is 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 what later became uh, uh, of some of these songs as far as re-records. But we're not talking about that on this show. This is That's another no. song. <laughs> oh yeah this is I, a great album iconic album cover 
Yeah. I love the whole thing with the candles and, you know, the the ones yeah. where the it's burning a little bit. But um, Richie Blackmore was on fire. Um, it's, yeah. it's sort of like he was invigorated because he had new blood. Oh, nice. So this is a Canadian <laughs> issue. I don't know yeah. if it's an original. Like by now, the, the they might have had they might have switched to this label. I'm not sure. Although it does have the the purple records logo on it. Now yeah. mine doesn't have anything inside of it. I know that um, I know that that it, it came with a lyric sleeve or something extra, but I, mine does not have that. Yeah, I like this album so much. I got a um, Japanese OB version, which is on the Warner Brothers label as well. So okay, yeah. Now. I've got a one of here is it's the only deep purple single that I have. Okay. Might just take your life. Nice. With uh, Cor Corona Rias Rebig, however you say that. Uh, yeah. This is actually uh, from France. I found this at a record expo. It's a cardboard sleeve. It's on EMI. And this is what the record itself looks like. So yeah, I saw I saw that. I said that it wasn't that much. I said, oh, I got to get that. That's cool. I so, love yes. that. I, you've shown that to me in another show, and I, I love yeah. the uh, the cover art. Those singles good. are great. Those you know, like the live shots, live. Yeah. Well, it's Street. exciting. It's an exciting yeah. show. Now, they didn't do much with the back cover. Maybe this is yeah. what all the French singles on EMI looked like at the time. I don't know. But yeah. Uh, Hey, hey, tell me something. Um, you know how it's uh, was that like uh, made for a jukebox? You know how it's got the big cutout in the in the forty fives. We didn't have that many in in Australia. We just had the little sort of you know the turn. This one, yeah. Hole. This is this was made for you know. I don't have. I've got a few somewhere, but I don't have one of the little spacers to put in there. Yeah. Some of them just came with a small hole, like for a, a yeah, you know, a regular. But yeah, most record players, you know, that I, you would. Um, Record players themselves would come with a, a bigger plastic thing that you yes. put down the spindle so that you could, yep. you know, play the, yeah. But yeah, yeah, gotcha. Um, so the next thing, same year, 1974, in pretty short order, Mark III are back again with an uh, incredible album cover. I love this album cover, Stormbringer. This cover image has been used on um, other albums as well i know that there's um an album by Susie and the banshees i believe it's called tinderbox that uses a black and white version of this image uh miles mm. davis bitches brew uses yep. this part of this album cover i love that's my this is my favorite deep purple logo for whatever reason uh it's my favorite um this one is different it's i've got a canadian one here but it's got the lyrics on the back cover yeah. Is yours a gatefold? Because no. mine is not. No, no, no. And I don't have anything else with it. It's It just came in a plastic sleeve with, again, very similar to Burn, Warner Brothers Burbank label with the Purple Records logo on it. No, this is uh, just uh, an Australian pressing on the Purple okay. label. Yep. Um, another great album that doesn't get the recognition. Um, Richie didn't like it because it was getting way too funky. But yeah. um, I think it's outstanding. And if you love Glenn Hughes, it's got his fingerprints all over it. Yeah. Uh, so the next the next thing I've got, now this is an interesting release. This is another one you may have seen or may not have seen. Um, well, what makes this compilation unique is that usually when something came out in, in Canada, uh, it also came out in the States. But this one doesn't seem to have a U.S. version. Now, if you go on Discogs, you'll see a listing for one from the U.S., but there's no real picture with it. So I don't think it is. However, I'm not sure exactly when it came out. I just know it's got a date of 1975 on it. 24 karat purple. Yeah, I've seen that around. Okay. Yeah. So it's yeah. just a compilation yeah. of Mark II stuff. It's got all the song titles up in the corner here. Yes. And on the back, it's got all of the, you know, uh, records up to that point. It's uh, this probably came out in the early 80s because this is when the Warner mm. uh, records were putting the maple leaf up in the corner here. Yes. Um, and uh, I don't know what else came with it originally. Yeah. There's another signal that this is a later 80s issue because it's now using the white. Most of my uh, most of my Van Halen records looks like this. 
Yes, and yes. the Alice Cooper yeah. records from the early 80s all look like this. Yeah. Um, so it's a decent compilation. I've also, I mean, I've got this on all the formats. Um, not the easiest thing to find on CD. I've got an old EMI CD of that, but that's yeah, yeah, one of one of the many uh, Deep Purple compilations, but a good one. Yep. I'm going to quickly put up um, this one, oh. which is Deep Purple Grats 1975. And um, to a lot of Purple fans, this is the mother load of Mark III. And a lot of the live performances out of this uh, were for Made in Europe. I actually do oh. have Made in Europe, but it's somewhere there. I just can't locate it, which is a great album. But um, yeah, Grats 1975, this is the full concert. And if you want to hear one of the top-notch Mark III uh, live albums. This is the one to get, Mark um, Grats, 1975. I've heard Mesa, that. I've heard it's a really Burn, good one. Yeah. Stormbringer, Gypsy, Lady Double Dealer, it's all there. And Richie Blackmore was on absolute fire. The next thing I've got is also 1975. I think this is an overlooked album. Don't taste the band. Um, of course, this is oh, the I only love this. one that uh, Tommy yep. Boland was on. Um, yep. This is the Canadian edition on Warner. And this one is a, a gatefold with a whole bunch of band photos, um, credits. And uh, I don't know if it had a lyric sleeve originally. Mine just yeah, has a it did. sleeve. It did. I've seen it, um, but I haven't got it. Mine's the, on, uh, on the purple label. Yeah, there's the Warner Brothers with the purple, smaller purple label yeah. on it. Hey, Tim, a lot of people say that this album is like the prototype for Whitesnake. I agree. Oh, I think so. A lot of the so. songs oh, so. uh, is mean, where the, 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 the nucleus for Whitesnake. Well, what, what's going on is that you've still got Coverdale, you've got uh, John Lord and Ian Pace, and you don't have Richie Blackmore uh, kind of leading the way anymore neoclassical doing that neo yeah so you yeah. so yeah you've got a, i mean a lot of these songs especially something like um especially something like love child could totally i could totally hear that on trouble or love hunter or snake bite or yeah any of that early yeah. white snake stuff but yeah, yeah. It, it was you know yeah at a certain point deep purple was or white snake was half deep purple which is mm. pretty crazy and that's it's such an interesting thing when you you look at those years, like say between seventy six and eighty four, what all of those guys were doing. First of all, most of them they had some sort of color, white snake, rainbow. You know, they're still they're still using that sort of terminology. Uh, so you mentioned this already. I do have this to show. Um, uh, obviously, it wasn't recorded then. It came out in nineteen seventy six. Now I don't know if this is before or after Deep Purple had broken up. I I think maybe. No, you know what? The liner notes from Jeff Barton and Pete Mikowski um, talk about this, about how Deep Purple were at least on hiatus, but made in Europe. I like that album a lot. Yeah. I actually prefer that to Made in Japan. Ooh, I, do sorry. Sorry, uh, I, I do too. Sorry. I do too. I like. I, I really I, like this. No, I do like this mm. one a lot. Um, this yeah. is a Canadian issue. This, you know, like those liner notes at the bottom. Now, this is interesting. When I bought this used, uh, it doesn't, it didn't have, I'll show you what the record itself looks like. Um, no purple logo at this point, just yep. the Warner Brothers. Um, but the lyric, the, the sleeve is not the sleeve that originally came with it. Now I looked at this and on the bottom, it's got what looks like a Warner Brothers, um, you know, catalog number, but it doesn't match this record. And I looked and then I turned it around and I thought, well, who is this? And I said, is that John Lord? No. So what I did was I, I typed in this, uh, catalog number into discogs uh what you see here this is from james taylor's greatest hits so uh mismatch a mismatch uh the only thing in common was that it was on warner brothers but uh it's better than just having the record you know bouncing around inside that sleeve <laughs> uh, uh, that's the fun thing about buying the, the them used you know the stories these these uh these used uh records have been on the the voyages they've taken if they can talk right yeah yeah absolutely the next thing I've got is from 1978. I don't know if, which is, I've seen I've that. Loved I haven't this got cover. it. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's like an awkward Star title. Wars, isn't it? It, it, it? Well, it always reminded me of like the bridge of the Enterprise from Star Trek. Yeah. Or but uh, Deep Purple, when we rock, we rock. And when we roll, we roll. A really annoying title to type out. I usually just put when we rock, dot, dot, dot. 
Um, mm. This has an original hype sticker on it, their greatest hits. It's got a gold stamp promotional copy, not for sale. And this is a U.S. copy on Warner Brothers. This one, I like this compilation because it includes a little bit of Mark I stuff, too. Um, this is, let's see, $2 for my own limo. For 2 bucks. Warner Brothers will send a special 2LP set over 20 top artists, each performing selections from their new album. Send for it and let limo take you on a ride with some of the biggest names in rock. The Doobie Brothers, Fleetwood Mac, Alice Cooper, Little Feet, Rod Stewart, Van Morrison, and many more. To get your limo, just send in the coupon for $2 and you'll be in the lap of musical luxury. So there's a, it's still like serrated here. Mercifully, somebody didn't cut this out. That's kind of neat. Sign of the times. And this is either it's a reissue or this is when Warner Brothers started using this label. Yep. I think it might be a, a reissue because I'm pretty sure I've seen a copy of the first Van Halen that's got the palm trees on the label. So might have been a transitional era. Yeah, yeah. Look, my copy of Van Halen has the um, the white Warner yeah. Brothers. So. Okay, so the next thing I have is from 1980, and I didn't realize this until later. I mean, it's only been two years since this compilation came up, but uh, Deep Purple fans will know, and I'm fascinated by this this whole story that it actually got as far as it did, but there was the faux Deep Purple, which was Ooh, Rod yes. and yes. assorted musicians going out and billing themselves as Deep Purple and not sounding very good. I've heard tell of people that have been to those shows and be like, that's awful. This is not Deep Purple. And it kind of ruined Rod Evans' career. I mean, he's never really done anything since then, I don't think. I know that, yeah, well, I think it did a disservice, you know. Well, there's rumors that he's actually in the medical um, business. He's either a, a nurse or um, he completely got out of the record business because basically he got sued. Yeah. And one of the uh, the settlement um, was basically that you give up the rights to your Deep Purple, yeah. and um, he, yeah, he just basically disappeared. Um, yeah. But Rod Evans had a little bit of a career. He uh, he was in a, a band called um, Brother Beyond, yeah. or it's no, Captain Captain, 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 Captain Beyond. Beyond. Yeah, Brother Beyond, Captain Beyond. Beyond. Yeah, 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 really, really good. Really, really yeah. good. But um, yeah, that was an absolute travesty. They played a series of shows. I think um, on YouTube you can see it, um, a concert live in Mexico, and Mexico. they can barely play, they can barely play "Smoke on the Water." Yeah, so, it's, it doesn't it terrible. doesn't make any it doesn't make any sense that they would get that far as to stage concerts and not have. It's like they never rehearsed or anything. But um, terrible. But what my understanding is that there was a promoter that was doing this with bands that were sort of defunct, not active, because I believe they did the same thing with Steppenwolf. They put it together like a, a faux version mm. of Steppenwolf. Really interesting. Same thing happened with Fleetwood Mac in like 74. Uh, yeah. The management put together this fake, fake version that was supposed to contain Mick Fleetwood, but it didn't. And people very quickly realized this is not Fleetwood Mac. Uh, yeah. So I think that's why in 1980, the Deep Purple organization responded by putting this out, which I think still, if you're going to get a single disc best of, this is the one. It is. Deepest Purple, the very best of Deep Purple. Uh, I've got a this, is a, this is an EMI version. Ian Pace had a hand in arranging this. Ian Pace, of course, was a fully a member of Whitesnake at this point, but they were protecting the brand, the Deep Purple brand. Yeah. Um, Folks, this, this got would... me into Deep Purple, this this album, and um, it went to number one in UK. Yeah. So it was, it was huge. Yeah. Of course, it came out on Warner Brothers in North America, but I've got the, the this is the only one. I like this Harvest logo, too. Oh, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, what, uh, what was, I'm sure, was convenient about this when it came out is that it contained Black Knight. It contained Demon's Eye and Strange Kind of Woman. So no matter where you got your copy of Fireball, you were covered. Uh, there's nothing from Mark One on it, but they did put Burn and Stormbringer on there. So, yeah, it's yeah. a good, solid, uh, you know, it's a good car album. If you're traveling, that's a good, it's a good CD to pop in. Absolutely. The only quibble is, uh, and probably there's only so much you can fit on an album with tracks, 
Um, they could have put something from Come Taste the Band. There's a lot of compilations. When they include Come Taste the Band, they always put You Keep On Moving, yeah, um, which seems to be the quintessential um, breakout song um, in those sort of compilations. But, uh, look, it's a mighty fine compilation. It is yeah. probably the best of the best, folks. Yeah. Uh, then, of course, um, the big news, 1984, Mark II reunites. Yes. And uh, this is kind of when this band came on my radar. I would have been 10, so I wasn't listening. But I do remember hearing that it was a big deal when this album came out, Perfect Strangers. What a and great comeback album. I've got, this is a Canadian copy on uh, yeah. Poly, Polydor. And um, this album did well for them. It was a platinum album. Now, this album contained, um, if you got the cassette or the CD originally, it had the song Not Responsible, which was not on here, but it also, the reissues also contained Son of Valeric. Yes. So, and also. There's, that's the Japanese version, which is not a gatefold. Yeah, mine's not a gatefold either, but it does have a yeah. nice cardboard sleeve. Yeah, that's uh, that's got lots of pictures in here. Um, that's that's the single knocking at your back door. Oh, which got that's a cool. lot of a lot that's of radio cool. airplay and wasted yeah. sunsets, which I love that song. A nice ballad. Yeah. Um, first personalized the label. Inch. A personalized okay. label this time around. I'm not sure. Nice. It probably the U.S. version looked the same, but yeah, those are cool. I don't have any of those singles. Um, I yeah. should also mention again for Ernesto, if you're collecting eight tracks, this is the last deep purple one, and the only RCO, and I don't have it. It's it's uh, it's mm. uh, hard as you can imagine. It's hard to find, <laughs> but it does exist. Um, and uh, the last thing that I have, unless you've got something different in between there is the uh the second of the short-lived mark ii uh comeback house of blue light 1987 this is also a canadian copy on polydor i don't yeah. think this album is quite as good as perfect strangers but bad attitude is one of my favorite deep purple songs ever yeah um strange packaging on this um yeah, I, I went on the Contrarians, you know, how they have their album show. And I said yeah. this is a, a really bad album um, by a great band. I think it's a really cheap looking, um, you know, the House of the Blue Light. Yeah, What's that it's, all about? it's not. It's a it, cheap it, it, yeah. concept. It's not a great album cover. This is what the vinyl looks oh, like. Oh, I haven't seen that. Yeah, okay. it's, a, it's nice. Yeah. Mine's on um, a straight, just Polydor. The polydor. Okay, yeah, it's got the standard red polydor. It's interesting, polydor instead of mercury uh, or vertigo, but um, yeah. it's all the same. It's all the same company. Now, of course, I mean, you know, this is not the end of the the deep purple stuff. They, I've seen nobody's perfect, the the double live album on vinyl. I didn't pick it up. Yeah. I, I there, you have. there you go. There you go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is a very lethargic album. I've read a oh. story where all the uh, suits that. Um, Polygram or Polydor, they listened uh, to the album because they were expecting it was going to sound like uh, Made in Japan and you could hear a pin drop. They thought, ugh. Um, yeah. yeah, it's really kind of lethargic. And, well, um, yeah, halfway through one of the songs, uh, Ian Gillen starts talking about Buddy Holly and it, it's yeah. uh, it's very, uh, very, uh, very casual. Um, yeah. The uh, what the selling point, I guess, when this came out is that you have Mark II doing a re-record of Hush, which you know was a Mark I song, and they released that as a single. Um, and of course, by virtue of having that, then Polygram then would reissue a myriad of compilations because they had access to Perfect Strangers, House of Blue Light, and then. Unfortunately, they were stuck with these live versions of the classic songs, which are not any, they're anything but the definitive versions of them. But you'll see, you know, uh, Knocking at Your Back Door, Best of Deep Purple in the 80s or Deep Purple Icon. And that's all they've got are those, you know, mm. pretty poor uh, live versions. And and not even really that much from the two albums that, you know, they, they were sort of promoting. Yeah. I, mean, I think the only song from, uh, I think, Hard Love and... I think Hard Loving Woman is the only song from House of Blue Light. 
So yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, like there's no, they don't they didn't do bad attitude. You know, like, no, no bad, bad, they, bad attitude is there. See, hard loving oh, woman and bad attitude. You know what? Knocking out your bad. <laughs> bad <laughs> attitude is not on uh, the um, any of the versions I've ever seen on cassette or CD. Weird. Yeah, that's How interesting. Bizarre. That's bizarre. So now, okay, so now I know what vinyl version I need to seek out, and that's the Australian version, because I did, I, honestly, I didn't know that. I know that yeah. the CD is shorter than the cassette, so that they didn't have to make it a double CD set, so there's less songs on it, but, yeah, wow, okay, yeah. See, this, is, this is good. This is why I like doing these. You learn things. Yeah. Can we talk about this album? Oh, you got that on vinyl. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I think this is really underrated. I think Me too. Um, Richie always said when he formed Rainbow that he wanted, he was looking for a keyboardist that sounded like John Lord. Well, he finally got him. Yeah. And he called it Deep Rainbow. Yeah. You've got Joe Lynn Turner. I think this is really uh, underrated. People rag on this album, yeah. but Me I, too. I love I, it. I think it sounds like a logical follow up to Been Out of Shape. I, you know, yes. Like, I'm not, you know, I like the commercial sounding stuff. My favorite Rainbow album is Straight Between the Eyes, you know, so I have no problem with their heavy I like that album sound. a lot. I, I, That's the best Jolene Turner album. Yeah. By far. Great but, singer. I mean, Jolene, he's, in my opinion, the only Yngwie Malmsteen album worth listening to is the one he was on, Odyssey. I agree. And, and they actually album. sound like... It's not him shredding all over the shop. Yeah. It's actually him it's actually, it's playing actually songs. Songs on it, yeah. Yes. Um, so, yeah, no, I've, I've never had a problem with, with Slaves and Masters. I mean, yeah, it's very rainbow sounding, but, you know, rainbow yeah. always was three-fifths purple, right? Yeah. Love Conquers All. I like that song. The Cut Runs Deep. Um, yeah. King, King of, of Dreams. Dreams is a classic. I mean, yeah. it got some radio airplay, but not as much as it should have. And it's on the... The RCA, the label, RCA label, yeah, label. yeah. which the um, RCA label, which they would be on for I think the next couple of albums in certain parts of the world. Yep, because I know my so, perpendicular CD is on RCA. It's Canadian. It wasn't in the states. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, absolutely. This didn't sell, and the record company um, basically said to Blackmore, um, "You get Gillen back in the band, or we're dropping you from the label," and. This is what yep. came out. The worst Deep Purple album, in my opinion. I hate this album. I just think it sounds like it's um, recorded in a silo. The material's not very good. Um, Tim, have you heard this album? You know, yeah, the Battle Rages. I, I remember the only song that I can remember how it goes is the title song, which was 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 okay. But apparently, yeah. a lot of these songs were already recorded. Uh, with Joel and Turner with different lyrics. Now, you know, yeah. he yes. he he calls the album The Cattle Grazes On. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not, yeah. a, not a big yeah. fan of it. But yeah, you could it sounds like what it is. It sounds like an album that was made under duress, which it was, and did not last. They went on tour, Blackmore left. Uh they brought in Satriani to finish the tour. Now there is a pretty yeah. good live CD called um I think it's called Come Hell or High Water that came yeah. out in 94 but yeah that and that that was truly it for mark absolutely Tudor. absolutely but yeah i'm you know i know it's cool that you got that on there. vinyl though i've never seen it on vinyl before yeah i think it's a very late reissue i got it on cd in the day but it just yeah. sounds so uninspired and the production's terrible and yeah I, I don't like it um one more album i'll chime in is a um a compilation that's been oh. recent called the many faces of deep purple and this is um kind of i love the right mount rushmore um yeah it's got everybody stash. that's ever been uh involved yeah. and it's sort of like all those um sort of uh offshoot bands oh yes yeah jolene turner Paige ashton lord or pal ian gillen band Funky Junction um, with the Thin Lizzy guys. That's interesting. Yes, yes. I've got that actually on vinyl. I should have brought that out. Um, Ian Gillen and Roger Glover, Vanilla Fudge. I don't know why they put Vanilla Fudge other than they were an inspiration for Mark One. Yeah. No, Company not... of Snakes. Yep. That go. was Mickey Moody and Bernie Mars did. Yeah. And... Um, so that, that the was thing a I can picture purchase. with Vanilla Fudge is that they often said Deep Purple sort of modeled themselves 
after Vanilla Fudge doing these like heavy versions of cover songs, which a lot of songs on those first three albums are covers, but yeah, it's strange that they put it on and out because there's no, I'm trying to think, I don't think there's any personnel in common. No, no, now you can, I think it's, I... you can draw like when, when you go back far enough, you can draw a line and connect because Vanilla Fudge had Carmine Apiece, who was in Blue Murder with John Sykes, who was in White Snake. With David <laughs> but it's like six uh, degrees of separation. Play a yeah. game, you know, yeah, the yeah. Uh, six degrees of separation with Richie. Uh, all, look, all ties that, Richie. My buddies and I, we used to do that all the time. They'd be like, Tim, link this band to this band. And I'd think for a second, I'd be like, well, there's this, this, and this, and this. And I try to find the quickest route. Very, very yeah. nerdy, very geeky. <laughs> Absolutely. Before so, we wrap it up, I've got to ask you yeah. a question. Favorite Deep Purple album? You know, mine's Burn. What's yours? Um, you know, I really like Perfect Strangers. I know it's a relatively newer one, but I really like In Rock too. You know, it might be In Rock. Okay. It might actually be In Rock. A lot um, of people love that. I really like all the la the latter day ones too. I, I just listened yeah. to Perpendicular this morning. Um, I really like Infinite. I like Now What. I like Whoosh. I didn't care for that covers album they put out that much. Terrible. Yeah. Terrible idea, uh, terrible choice of songs, but but the, all of the Steve Moore stuff, it, yeah, and especially the latter day ones with Ezra producing, have been really consistent. Superb, with yeah, great song. And, and they're still kicking around with Simon McBride on guitar, so who knows? We may see a. These guys are you know getting way way up there, but we may see another Deep Purple record yet. And if we do, I think we should review it. Absolutely, hundred <laughs> percent. So, Peter, what what have you got uh, coming up? Rock Day, Dream Nation, you've always got some shows happening. What, what's new with you? Well, I've got a show coming out um, very soon with uh, Phil Aston of yes. uh, Now Spinning Magazine. He was on yeah. the Sea of Tranquility. Yeah. And we're doing a show on John Lord, Spotlight on John Lord, just talking about our favourite John Lord memories because he's he kind of gets a bit forgotten when folk talk about deep purple they talk about gill and they talk about blackmore but they don't talk about john lord so That's because just the personalities, done a whole show. i think, I think yeah, the personalities just, demand the attention right but yeah, yeah. the john lord is so vital so vital to that band so we're awesome. just going to do a show on john lord so right on all right well peter thank you for taking the time to uh, go through our deep purple vinyl i really enjoyed it i really enjoyed seeing the differences in what we have and not only what we have as far as editions, but ones that we have that are different from each other. So uh, I Absolutely. knew there would be compilations and live albums that were different. And I was right because there are so many. <laughs> so uh, good to be on. So, so favorite Deep Purple album, folks, uh, comment below. If you've got any really odd Deep Purple vinyl, we'd love to see it. And uh, make sure and subscribe to Rock Daydream Nation. Uh, thanks for subscribing to Tim's Vinyl Confessions. Don't forget tpublic.com for all the TBC merch. Uh, Peter, have you got merch yet? No, or you, no, no, no merch for no. no. Okay, <laughs> no merch. all right. I'm, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the shill around here. <laughs> uh, but there you go. So thanks everyone for watching this edition of Tim's Final Confessions. We'll see you later. Cheers.